Okay, well, let's talk about Mars. Different topic, different planet, a lot of options. Um, when I try to explain to people what I am as a planetary geomorphologist, I'd, I'd like to explain to people that, in principle, geomorphology as we practice it on Earth is a, is a science that is devoted to telling stories, looking at the landscape and trying to decipher what rocks and what different types of landforms are telling us. And in particular, I like this, uh, this quote that you can see rocks and layers of rock as sort of the, the book chapters or the words in which the story of our landscape has been written down. And if you know the language, if you know the grammar, if you know the examples, you can actually tell the story of, of a landscape. Well, in a sense, it's of course a very nice analogy of, of how we would approach looking at different planets as well. Because if we look at the planets in our solar system, they also have a surface, they also have a landscape, which means that if we look at that landscape, we are also capable of telling the story of those other places in our solar system. Now, the easiest way to look at a surface, to look at the landscape, is to consider which forces are at play that give the shape, that give the morphology to the landscape itself. And you can sort of subdivide them into two different groups. The first one, and we've already seen some very nice examples of it, are the, the endogenic, or sorry, the, um, um, yeah, the endogenic, the internal processes. You can think of all the processes that shape our landscape as a result of the internal heat engine of the Earth. So the effect of plate tectonics, uh, the effect of mountain building, of earthquakes, of volcanic eruptions, they're all related to the heat within the planet, if you would sort of simplify it to that case. But at the same time, when these forces are trying to build up the landscape, we of course also have processes that are acting to sort of, sort of, yeah, sort of t tear it down, to erode the landscape. And of course, there's a very nice photo of Iceland. Again, uh, the three of us have something in common with Iceland, again, traveling with Ruhl. Uh, so you'll see uh, another uh, couple of nice examples uh, in Iceland as well. But I like this one because you can see the Svartifoss waterfall in Iceland, um, and it's sort of eroding the basalt column. So the, sort of the formation that was produced by those internal forces is now being eroded by those external forces. So the balance between those two sort of gives you the idea of how a landscape develops. So when you see a landscape, try to imagine what forces are at play. Now, this is also the part where it becomes very interesting if you start to look at different planets in our solar system, because if you look at the four rocky planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, they're all rocky planets, but they all have a different story to tell because the balance between those forces, between the endogenic forces, the way in which those planets developed internally, and the forces that are playing on the exterior of the planet, they differ. Which means that their landscapes have a different story to tell on how these planets evolved and how they eventually became the planets that we see nowadays in our solar system. And if we look at these planets, we can immediately see that Mercury is a very small, grey, rocky planet. It's really a tectonic planet where we can see that there are very beautiful fault systems, completely different uh, than what we would see on other places. Mercury actually shrunk in its diameter by 14 kilometers. So you have to imagine a Himalaya mountain range on both sides of the planet. That's the size that it contracted because it cooled down uh, as a result of a different internal structure, a very thin uh, rocky crust on the outside. Well, Venus itself is a place where you definitely don't want to go. I mean, this is sort of the um, epitomant of hell in our solar system. I mean, the, the temperatures at this planet, because of the very thick atmosphere, sort of the runaway greenhouse um, processes are tremendous. A couple of hundred degrees, very high pressure. And it's really not comparable to what we see on Earth. A very beautiful, very lush planet, really a blue dot, if you would look it up at different, uh, different photos that are made of the inner solar system. And then all the way on the other side, we have planet Mars. And of all the four rocky planets, if we exclude the Earth, the, the three remaining, this is a particularly interesting one. Because it really has a different type of landscape, and it has a very interesting story to tell. This started in the Netherlands. The very first person in history that started to observe planet Mars, of course there were many before him, but the first one to really see a geological surface feature was Christian Huygens. And he used his own home-built telescope to look at Mars, and he saw this very strange sort of triangular patch at the surface. And he was able to use it to determine that Mars is rotating. A couple of years later, he discovered there were polar ice caps. And Mars was really turning into a planet with landscape, with features, and it was not really that red little star that you could see at the night sky. It was actually more of a, a planet with, with features on it. 
But then a couple of years later, a couple of generations later, um, when our telescopes improved, there was a new way of looking at Mars. And these two guys, Giovanni Schiaparelli and Percival Lowell, they were really adamant about the idea that there were channels at the surface. Channels, of course, being artificially dug structures in the landscape where water was flowing, flowing through. And this meant that possibly there could be, well, technically advanced life capable of digging channels to sort of, as the Dutch do it in the Netherlands, um, sort of manage the water in the landscape on Mars. They saw these kinds of things, straight lines and features. Of course, it was a very interesting idea, but not everyone was as convinced that these were really uh, features at the surface. And it was a very nice experiment done uh, by, uh, by Edward Maunder, um, and he enlisted the help of school children to draw a picture of Mars. And basically, the auditorium, like the one we're sitting in today, served as a way of emulating the effect of telescopes. So the people sitting closer to the picture of Mars, they were drawing a picture, basically, what you could see through a telescope with a very good resolving power, with a, a sharpness that allowed you to see the details. They were actually seeing the differences in, in surface textures, but the people at the back weren't able to see anything at all. But somewhere in the middle is a place where people started seeing the channels, the straight lines. And this illustrated that in reality, those sort of artificial waterways were in fact an optical illusion. Now, of course, this is interesting because when we are trying to tell a story about a landscape and we're apparently seeing things that aren't there, that's not really a good thing to tell a good story. And this all changed, thankfully, to the advent of, of spaceflight. Because now we had the ability to take the telescopes and take the cameras and fly them all the way to Mars and take the pictures of the landscape up there. And this really revolutionized the way in which we observed the planet Mars. Because up close and personal with the red planet, we were able to see the details that we definitely could not see before on, uh, on the Earth. So all the way in the upper corner, you can see the caldera, sort of the depressions that were formed by the collapse of um, magma chambers. We were able to detect a very nice, very big Grand Canyon system, really the, the grandest of Grand Canyons in our solar system. And of course, the very big volcano, Olympus Mons, turned out to be, I think, something like 26 kilometers uh, tall, so bigger than any mountain that we would have seen here on Earth. So the planet Mars really transformed into a different planet, a planet where landscapes were suddenly much more familiar, where we could see a lot more detail. Now, I'm curious how well you guys are at recognizing landscapes. So I prepared a little test. Don't worry, you won't be able to fail for it. But the idea is very simple. I've collected a couple of photos, and I want you guys to say whether these are photos taken from features at the surface of Mars, or whether they are features of the surface of the Earth. Now, if you think it's uh, from the Earth, you don't have to do anything at all. Just relax, enjoy the show. If you think it's from Mars, please raise your hand. OK? I will start off with the first one. What do you think? Earth or Mars? Okay, don't, don't be shy, you know. <coughs> okay, good, good. Um, we'll go to the next one. I'll explain later what, what, we, uh, what we just saw. Any idea? Earth or Mars? Okay, a few hands going up. Some people questioning. Okay, well, we'll just skip to the next one, see what you think of this one. Beautiful picture again, Earth or Mars, people with Mars with uh, the hands. So you guys think this is Earth? Okay, okay, good. This one? Okay, definitely Mars if I see that. Okay, okay, good. <clears throat> this beautiful one, piece of art almost. Yeah, I didn't say this is going to be easy, but it's uh, okay. This one? Okay, no hands. That's interesting. Okay, good. <coughs> Another beautiful one. Sort of a brainy type of terrain. Okay. Then finally, this one. Yeah, if Vigri is putting his, uh, his hand up, uh, it's definitely going to be Mars. Yeah. Okay, so the interesting thing is, 
that all these photos are actually from the planet Mars. And this sort of shows you that there are a number of features, a number of, a number of landscapes that really share resemblances to what we see here, here on our own planet. And it's really interesting because if you already know how landscapes are working, you can make use of that knowledge to understand how the story of different planets is written. And just to give you a number of examples that also involve Iceland, um, because of course we're talking here at the occasion of Roux, um, this is a very nice formation that uh, they, uh, they image. If you zoom in onto these layers, you get these very beautiful columnar structures, and we think that these actually resemble the, the type of columnar basalt that you would find in Iceland, for example, at the south coast near Vik. But there are also other examples. If you look at these structures, these are formations, or these are lava tubes that um, at a certain point drained during a volcanic eruption, and they caved in, producing these troughs and sort of these skylights. And if you go to the south in Iceland, you can actually walk around in one, and you can see the same skylights, and you get a sense of the, the structure and the scale of these things. And one of my personal favorites are these types of formations. These are what we call pseudo-craters, or rootless cones. And they are formed when lava is flowing over a layer with volatiles, such as ice or water. And the steam that is produced sort of explodes and produces these well, sort of rootless cones, these sort of fake volcanic craters. I can assure you, you don't want to be standing there when it happens, but they're not really the same type of volcanic uh, crater that forms at, at a volcanic vent, uh, vent site. But these details are, of course, very interesting to see. This is sort of the, the resolution, the sharpness that we have nowadays at the surface of Mars, almost uh, the, you know, sort of an um, espionage type of uh, a camera. But if you go to, uh, to Iceland, you can again find a similar example of these types of, uh, of craters. So the best way of going to Mars might not be waiting until um, the guys that are developing rockets are actually launching people to Mars. It's just to, to book your ticket, get a very nice chance, look at some real volcanoes erupting and some ash layers, and at the same time you can walk through landscapes that sort of resemble the stuff that we see on the red planet. Well, I mean, that gets me exciting. I don't know about you guys, but it's... Um, anyway. But of course, when you're looking at the landscape, um, there are also differences. Because those analogies are fine, but planet Mars is smaller. It's a planet with a different history. Um, it has a, because it's smaller, it has a lower gravity. Um, it has almost no atmosphere. So this has some consequences on how we interpret landscapes. Now the trinity in planetary geoscience is more or less uh, related to these three central topics. Of course, we're using satellites to look at the landscape. This is what gives you the first idea of, of what you um, see at the surface. You can use field work or the analogy with landscapes here on Earth to get a sense of what type of landscape this is. Of course, this example is very simple with the uh, bark and sand dunes. Um, but of course, if you want to um, incorporate the effects of the different conditions at the surface of Mars, you would typically need to involve experiments. This is really the practical side of planetary science. And together with those experiments, you are able to truly understand what is going on, how these processes might be evolving and might be working at the surface of Mars. But the atmosphere in particular is something that I want to briefly uh, talk about, because, of course, the atmosphere is something that we need as a, um, as a human to, to survive, but it also has some important ramifications for how processes are developing, how landscapes are developing under the influence of a continuous airflow across the surface. Now, the interesting thing is that Mars probably lost a fair deal of its atmosphere, probably due to the interaction of the solar wind, really stripping away the atmosphere, blowing it away into space. And the interesting thing is that over the course of Mars's history, this has caused the planet to change its climate dr drastically. Nowadays, it's really a, um, sort of a, a desert planet. And of course, we also find a number of um, differences, a number of features in the landscape that are pointing towards those drastic changes in the landscape. Again, if we look at Earth and Mars, you might wonder what kinds of changes are, are taking place. What are the, the consequences of having a thinner atmosphere? Well, it's perhaps most simple to conduct a very simple, very easy thought experiment. How would a frisbee fly on Mars? Didn't you all ever wonder how a frisbee would fly? Well, <coughs> just to give you an idea, if I have a frisbee, and I definitely hope I'm not going to fail on this one, um, back row, uh, just watch your head, okay? Um, if I fly this one, oh, excellent. You can see that it stays in the air. 
Now, if you imagine that Mars has a lower force of gravity, it tends to fall down a lot slower on Mars. So, in principle, you might be able to throw it a lot further before it hits the ground. But at the same time, because you have a very thin atmosphere, it doesn't produce the same equivalent type of lift. And this means that your frisbee really doesn't frizz, it doesn't fly. Um, and to give you a sense of how that would look like, here on Earth, you need to weigh it down. You need to make it at least, well, let's just say, about 30 times as heavy. <coughs> which is this one, which is uh, weighed down with a dumbbell. Um, first row, let's give it a try. <laughs> no, I won't throw this, it, just uh, because of safety reasons. But you can imagine that um, basically your Frisbee is not really capable of being airborne on Mars that, that well. Now, if you apply this idea, if you apply the, the concept that the atmosphere is really the, um, um, the party pooper in the story of how materials may be blown away, then you can imagine that looking at landforms like these sand dunes is sort of placing things into perspective. Because of the very thin atmosphere, people used to think that perhaps these sand dunes would be fossils at least relics from periods that maybe the, the atmosphere on Mars was thicker and more suitable to blow away those sand particles. So there, there were some wind tunnel experiments and some measurements by landers, and they all show that the wind speeds that you need on Mars are way too high and way too exotic to mobilize those sand particles. But a couple of years ago, something changed. Because if you look very closely at, this, at the dune itself, you can see those very small ripples, and they appear to be moving. Throughout the seasons, those ripples were migrating. There were new avalanches taking place at the crest of the dune downslope. And this really showed that these sand dunes weren't really fossils. They were actually active landforms. And if you imagine that the atmosphere is so incredibly thin, our frisbee didn't fly, it crashed, you can imagine that blowing away a sand particle is a very interesting conundrum. It's really difficult to understand why this happens. And nowadays, of course, because we have different tools, different experiments that we can perform, uh, it becomes easy to, to look at different factors, different processes that, that are contributing to uh, sort of solving this riddle on Mars. Um, this is a wind tunnel that I work with in Denmark, and we can really reduce the atmospheric density, the air pressure inside the wind tunnel, and then we can allow, through the propeller, the wind to blow around, and we can look at different sand particles, different grain sizes, and look at how these particles are put into motion. Now, in this case, we were looking at the effects of rolling, and we can see that this happens at much lower wind speeds. So those particles can start rolling, and then eventually they go into this sort of hopping motion that we call saltation. And then it becomes interesting, because on Mars, apparently, you don't need as much of a wind speed to keep particles moving. So the challenge really is to get that sand moving in the first place, and then physics takes over and makes it very easy to, to keep this material um, sort of airborne because of the effect of splashing and other processes taking place. So the very cool thing is that nowadays if we um, are actually roving around on Mars and we have these beautiful photos of sand dunes and materials, we are now able to understand a little bit better or tell the story of this, uh, these types of features a, lot, a little bit better because we are capable of traveling to Mars because we have the instruments, the eyes, the instruments on the ground, in this case with a beautiful Mars rover Curiosity. And to me, really one of the highlights is the fact that if we're talking about the detail, about the materials that we are studying, again, rocks and sand layers, they are sort of the, the words, the, um, the language in which the, landscape, the story of the landscape is written, we can actually take pictures of sand grains on Mars. Well, I think this is very cool. And these sand grains, of course, they have new stories to tell, new ways in which we can utilize those sand particles to understand how the climate on Mars at the surface is currently interacting with these types of materials. But I think that is a story perhaps served for another time. So thank you very much.